Good evening. Welcome to the March 15, 2023, the Ides of March regular session, BPU. Uh, welcome everyone who's here in the room with us tonight. We'll welcome everybody who's listening or viewing online or via phone. Uh, this is a reminder that this meeting is being recorded by both video and audio. And to that end, uh, the microphones around this room are very sensitive. So please um, be um, be as quiet as you can be, or otherwise it will pick up the sound. Uh, we do, as always, have a public comment section this evening. Uh, if you are in the room and would like to speak, please sign in over here. Um, and if you haven't done so, please do so now. Um, in that In that time, we would ask that you address any comments you have directly to the board and not to our staff. Um, Members who are attending the meeting online, if you wish to address the board, we would ask you to use the raise hand feature at the bottom of the application uh, when, we, when we go to the public comment section. Uh, if you are connected by phone only, we ask that you would press star nine to indicate that you wish to address the board, it also in the public comment section. Uh, comments are limited to five minutes. And again, should be directed to the board. Uh, these comments are public and we would caution any visitors who are speaking either here in the room or uh, via Zoom to not disclose any confidential account information or to disclose account information on an account that is not in your name. Uh, we will Staff will not provide individual account information uh, or history in an open meeting. One thing I'd like to um, add to our opening this evening is that we've heard uh, many folks have visited our meetings in, in recent sessions and we appreciate the engagement. We continue to appreciate the engagement. Um, and, and the folks who have visited us and have, have called in or uh, participated via Zoom, they have asked uh, this board to be respectful of those in the community who also own this utility. And I completely agree with that sentiment. And I know everybody here on the board does as well. One thing that I think we need to ask at this point is that folks who are addressing the board also be respectful in their comments. Um, I will ask that, and, and again, third reminder, please address your comments to the board, not to the staff. Um, one, an additional thing I would ask is, if folks are in the gallery here in the room, if y'all need to have like a side conversation of any kind, if you guys would just take it out to the hall, please. Again, the, the microphones are very sensitive to it. Um, we've got presenters that are here, um, and just to be respectful to the presenters, um, but obviously the others in the room, we would ask that you take it to the hall. So thank you for that. Um, as always, you may call the BPU, you may email the BPU, you may email the board members uh, with any other comments or questions or concerns you may have. Uh, the agenda and presentations may be found on BPU's website. Uh, if you're using Zoom, they'll appear on your screen. My name, for those of you who do not know me, is Rose Mulvaney Henry. I'm a member at large position three and I'm the current board president. Other members of our board and staff include Bill Johnson, our general manager, David Haley, member at large position two, who is joining us uh, via Zoom this evening, Tom Groneman, second district and board vice president, Bob Milan, first district and board secretary, Jeff Bryant, third district, Mary Gonzalez, member at large position one, Angela Lawson, Deputy Chief Counsel. I would remind everyone to put your phones on silent, please. And before we begin our meeting, I would ask that you rise with me and join us in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Angela, may I have roll call, please? Roll call, Greneman. Here. Oh, it's good to see you. I haven't seen Here. you. Here. Mylan. Here. Mulvaney Henry. Here. Bryant. Here. Gonzalez. Here. You have a quorum. Um, I, before I ask for a motion to approve tonight's agenda, I'll ask if there are any corrections, revisions, suggestions, et cetera. Mr. Jeff, move to approve. Mary, I second. It's been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Roll call, Greneman. Aye. Haley. Aye. Mylan. Aye. Mulvaney Henry. Aye. Bryant. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. That motion carries. Thank you. Uh, before I ask for approval of the minutes for the regular session of the March 1st, 2023 meeting, I'll ask if there are any corrections, errors, anything. This is Jeff. Move to approve. No, I'm not second. It's been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Roll call, Greneman. Aye. Haley. Aye. Mylan. Mulvaney Henry. Aye. Bryant. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. That motion carries. Hold on one second. Do I have minutes to approve from February 15th as well? You have them there. They were already approved at the last meeting. You have them to sign. Okay. Just making sure I'm all right. Thank you. Bill, turn the meeting over to you. All right. Thank you. Uh, I do have one visitor that signed up to speak tonight. Uh, so I'll call Susan Stevens to come up. And if you can uh, state your name and address for the record, and you have five minutes to address the board. Hi, I'm Susan Stevens um, with Community Conscience Action Network, um, and I live at 4018 Silver Avenue, Kansas City, Kansas 66106. Um, um, a lot of our issues with the rising costs of utilities, it's, it's actually started to hit me more personally. Up until now, I was active, I mean, because of the way a lot of people in the community were suffering. I've been in a really nice situation in a it's a little 816 square foot house owned by my brother um, that my 18 year old and I are, are um, living in. And he was, he was like, as long as the house isn't costing me money, I don't care how much rent you pay. Just And so basically what I was paying him was like a really reasonable amount for me, which has been a wonderful help. Um, four years ago when I moved in, what I was paying him for rent um, was like, about 200 more than what he was paying out in terms of the utility. He had all the utilities in his name. He still does. So he, that's all comes out of his account and it's all covered. So I haven't really had to worry about utility bills or anything, and, but what he, and but with the rising cost in utilities coupled with, this is a UG issue, but the rising property valuation, um, he, he was just like showing me the costs. And it's like now, whereas, Four years ago, what I was paying him was like giving him at least a $200 profit over the expenses he had with the house. Now um, it's like about 50, it's like it's costing him about 50 some more a month than what I'm paying him. So I'm, I'm figuring out how to scramble around and at least pay him. He's not pressuring me at all, but just, I don't like it costing him money. So to pay him a little more, he's, and he's talking about, he's going to put some insulation in the attic to see if that helps with the heating bill, maybe the rest of this winter and next winter and stuff. But it just, I guess it hits home because um, there's just such a, a, and I understand you guys aren't connected with the UG part. So I, I, I mean, as far as like our property value was 40, the, it's a little 18, 816 square foot house. Um, property value was, I guess, 40,000 when I moved in four years ago. Now it's 70,000. And of course, other people's property value. So that just makes the taxes go way up like it is all over. That's, I, I know, I, but I'm, I'm, so I just, I just wanted to let everybody know I'm really um, now very personally engaged in wanting to, as well as I have been, but realizing, you know, I'm 58, I'm not retired yet, I'm still working, but I'm not looking at, at this age of suddenly just having huge increases in income or anything. But the costs of living are just going, it just seems like the affordable housing situation is just like really, really bad right now. And, and the, and just everything going up. So I'm very excited that you guys are working on, I know you're wanting to work on having the, the groups that are going to kind of work to try to figure out. And I know we've got the young man who's 
talked several times about helping with knowing how to allocate the federal money that we're getting. And I'm just really, I'm going to stay engaged. I'm going to keep coming and paying attention because I really, um, I see that this is something that we need to be engaged in because it's impacting so many people. And um, we got to work to figure out a way to make it more affordable to live here for the, for the majority of the people who live here who are fairly low income. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Ms. Stevens, a uh, couple things, if you, a couple things. Uh, one is in the, uh, in the work session earlier, we talked to the board about launching a uh, energy efficiency program. And uh, okay. that my hope it will be rolling out very soon. So we do have Patrice in the back of the room that can that can help help you with that. And I don't know if you listened to uh, the work session earlier. I was I didn't just got here a little okay. while ago. Okay. So Patrice, if you can raise your hand so she can she can she can uh, give you some insight on the onto that program when we're going to be launching it and things like that. The other is Janetta Henson is in the back. If you want us to take a look at your at your account. And see, oh, okay. see if we can determine anything from that, then she can certainly help you with that too. Well, I'll try to bring the information next time because I don't have it on me. Okay. So, I mean, I mean, if you want to bring it back back next time, but, you know, if you want to talk to her between now and the next board meeting, certainly uh, Janetta's in the back room with the, uh, she's got her hand raised too. Hey, Bill, I don't think that she's the account person. I think it's her son's account. Okay. So, well, if, if you her can brother, have your, yeah. Brother. Okay. Brother. Yeah. So I don't know that she'd be able to talk about the account. All right. Though. So if you can have your son speak to, thank you, thank you for that. If you can have your son speak to them, Ms. Stevens, then that, that'll, uh, we can see if we can help him out. Okay. Next is uh, David Smith. If you can come up and uh, state your name, address for the record, and, you know, five minutes. My name is David Smith. My address is 400 Soup Avenue, in Kansas City, Kansas. And coming to the board meetings the last few times, I've discovered if you come a little early, you can listen to the uh, through the Triton. That's very informative. I've also learned a couple of things here in the last few weeks of the board trying to set up some relay from the public to the board, maybe to one of the representatives of the board. I don't know how they're going to work it yet, <clears throat> but I think that's a great idea to involve the community more. It will help you people anyway, because you people all work all, all week long. I'm retired, so I don't. So it gives me a lot of extra time to be involved in more community projects, which I have been doing for almost as long as I am old. But now that I'm retired, I have more time to to be more involved than what I have been. And I hope I can, Lord willing, and River doesn't put it too high. But I think the board is to be commended for the trying of different combinations to help the general public in Wyandotte County as we are the lowest income in the state with the highest amount of taxes, which is, oh well. But the board seems to be very, very interested in helping the general public, especially the lower income people. And I think that's great. Even with the weatherization, the landlords that get it it'll never reach the apartments or the houses. It just won't. I don't know how they get around it, but they do. But I just want to commend you people for what you do. And I appreciate everything you've done. Thank you. Bill, can I come in? Thank you. Yeah. So, so Mr. Smith, you know, after listening to the presentation, because I always have that, you know, hesitation to believe that our dollars are getting where they right. can best serve. But the... The way the program is going to be Im implemented will be, it'll all be managed in, and ran uh, hands-on by not the owners of the property. I so, that so earlier. yeah, so that means that that a landlord, say, did it for an apartment building, 
the landlord wouldn't just get a check. What he'd do is he would get people to come out and do the audit, and then he'd get people to come out and do the upgrades. So he doesn't have the ability just to siphon off the money. And I like the program that's ran like that. Now you said something about Habitat for Humanity. That's great. It will work. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Smith. <laughs> Rob, there, uh, I think I see a couple of hands raised. Yes, sir. There are three hands raised. Uh, the first one I'm unmuting is Ty. So, Ty, are you unmuted? Uh, Ty, you'll have to hit star six on your phone to unmute. Or if you're connected through Zoom, you should be able to just hit unmute in the bottom left hand corner. All right, I'm, go I'm going to go ahead and move to the next one. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next one is the phone number ending in 9310. And since you are a phone only customer, phone number ending 9310, you'll have to hit star six to speak. They disconnected. Uh, going back to Ty. Ty, if you wish to speak, you'll have to unmute. It's working now. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir, we can. Okay. Hi, right. if you can uh, state your name and address for the record, and you have five minutes. All right. Thank you. This is Ty Gorman at 2843 Parkwood Boulevard, uh, KCK. Um, thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak. Uh, sorry, I couldn't be there in person. That out of town. Um, wanted to, I've been listening for the last couple of hours and uh, appreciate the topics that were covered. Um, I want to first address the working group discussion from a couple of hours ago. The, uh, the thing I heard a lot in that um, meeting was around how uh, you guys would like to receive information from the community, so the size of the group, the frequency of the meetings, who chooses who's there. Um, those kinds of uh, issues are, are, are fine, but the the real crux of the situation to me is how the people in the community engaging are being brought into complicated issues through the staff and through ongoing working groups. So, for example, a you know the the issues have already been brought to the board over the past year uh, and probably before that, but. Uh, and then they're, they're brought in ways that I think uh, Susan's uh, uh, situation was, it was well explained and kind of talked about some of the systemic problems within her, the personal story there. And the response was to get her help uh, through the customer uh, service program. And, um, and then the working group would be <laughs> trying to answer the question, why does this keep happening? Why, uh, for example, um, are either rates too high, rates uh, are fixed as fees on lowest income customers, which is the worst way to structure utility revenue. And so how, how can we change that? And why are people's uh, power getting cut off when they are vulnerable and in danger from that? And so and then when you look, those are all very difficult problems to solve. So having access to staff and resources for community working groups to help solve that problem is, I think, the point of this. I mean, if if staff and the board could had the uh, the ability and the uh, and the time to solve that problem completely, uh, then we wouldn't have kept kept seeing them for years and had uh, the community be uh, kind of consistently disappointed and outraged around those issues when they try tried to come to VPU. So, the total rate. Uh, decrease is going to be addressed in the rate hike uh, and rate case cost service rate case coming up in the next few months. That's a quick turnaround for community engagement on why the prices are high, and that can do with that has to do with generation decisions and uh, and and staff decisions that the community can and should be involved in based on rate 
cases in municipal utilities around the country that we've talked about. So there's ways we need to plug in there. We need that that's the staff and data in order to plug in appropriately. So staff needs to be able to tell us uh, the, you know, the information that community needs to engage meaningfully on that conversation. Uh, same with why the flat fees are the way they are. Not only the pilot fees and whatnot that we talk about a lot that are the UG's decision, but the electric connect, water connect, flat fees that are uh, increased often instead of increasing rate percentages because, uh, and, and that puts the highest burden on the lowest uh, income folks in the utility as well. So how to redo that revenue distribution is a big uh, question and the community can uh, and should be involved in answering that question. But again, need more than a quarterly, uh, just meeting with board you members have one minute. Um, who, who, as the last speaker pointed out, are working part time and uh, not, don't necessarily have all the, the detailed answers in this way. So. Um, just want to point all that out as long and with the efficiency programs as well. There's lots of things the community could uh, engage in there. We only you only talked about the block grants and the um, and kind of the major uh, programs that have to come through cities. There are a lot of competitive energy efficiency and work training programs to keep those jobs in KCK. So so many opportunities to engage, but we need more than just quarterly meetings with board. We need uh, a real meaningful program that has a staff consideration and well staff access to resources, collection of data and transparent input into the decision-making process. So that's uh, my time, I appreciate it. I hope, uh, hope to hear back from you soon with more details when I'm back in town. Thank you, Ty. Thank you. Thanks, Ty. Uh, so we'll move on to our guest speaker tonight. Uh, I'll ask David to come up and introduce our guest. And uh, he'll be providing a legislative update. Uh, you know, I had Kimberly and Josh both on the agenda. I think Kimberly's a little bit under the weather. So send her, up, send her, her our best, uh, Josh, if you will. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Um, where I have our speaker come up here. Yeah, Kimberly's under the weather. So she's gonna, we're, I'm just talking to Josh. We're gonna have her come back here after the legislative session has concluded to give kind of a recap of the legislative session, which she's done before and kind of look ahead what we're gonna be possibly facing uh, in the next legislative session. So some of you know Josh Savati pretty well, some of you don't. Um, he's got over 20 years of Kansas state politics experience. Uh, he was elected four times to the Kansas legislature from his home district in uh, central Kansas. And in fact, uh, the district where he was uh, constantly reelected, he was a Democrat in a two to one Republican district. Um, following his tenure, um, Governor Parkinson named him as the Secretary of Agriculture for the great state of Kansas. Um, after that, he worked over here at the senior advisor to the regional administrator of the EPA, Region 7, our region. So he has uh, a, a wealth of experience at the federal um, and state level. He's testified before, before Congress and uh, deeply involved with um, uh, what's going on in Topeka. Um, he and Kimberly partners with their um, firm. Uh, they do a lot of work on behalf of EPU. KMU, Kansas Power Pool, and Kansas Municipal Electric Agency. So uh, I'm going to hand things over here to Josh. We, this is a very detailed, long PowerPoint. Uh, it is on our website, and we'll be happy to print it out for you as well, because some of it he's going to go through, but he want to kind of let you know what kind of what's what's all in, involved with some of this federal funding. Josh, the microphone's here, sir. Perfect. Thank you, David and, and Bill and members of the board and uh, everyone else that might be listening. A, a special shout out to uh, Senator Haley, who I think is also listening. And he caught me in the building today and he's like, my goodness, I got a couple of things going, but I'm going to try to be there uh, electronically. And so uh, I have known Senator Haley uh, uh, since I came into the legislature 20 years ago now. So it, it's great to still work with you. Also, my biggest thing to fame is that uh, Bill and I weren't on the very last flight out of the old airport, but we were pretty darn close. And I ate a really 
old stale package of Pringles uh, for a very high price uh, right before they close that thing down. So uh, anyway, it's great to be here. As David said, there's like 70 slides. I am not, I'm gonna fly through them, but I don't, I'm not gonna talk through them because nobody has that amount of time. Um, but it's nice. I mean, the board makes these publicly available so anybody can look through these uh, and reach out with questions if you have them because there's a lot there. And before I get started, I wanna make sure that we understand kind of where all of this came from. So, so COVID happened. The federal government, as people shut down everything, uh, made a huge concerted effort to keep businesses going and keep the general public going and the economy going. And so they had some pretty loosely structured economic support. Uh, some of it they dumped to the states, some of it they just dumped generally uh, back to um, different industries in an effort to keep everybody going. Uh, after that, uh, and particularly with the beginning of the Biden administration, they began uh, passing more structured, large-scale investments. Uh, and you'll see the three of those up here, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, then the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, BIL, and then the Inflation Reduction Act. And so all three of those were historically large. Uh, I'll spend my time mostly on the Inflation Reduction Act, but uh, all the first two also have implications. Um, these were uh, investments uh, in the form of billions coming in for broadband access, for roads and bridges, for uh, lead pipe map mapping, uh, for passenger rail, a wide variety of different opportunities coming down um, with those. And you can see uh, you add those up and you're talking in the trillions of dollars, not trillions, plural, I guess, but 1.2 trillion uh, coming back to the states from the federal government uh, in the form of the IIJA and then the BIL. So huge amount of investment coming back to be spent. Uh, and, and this gets back into I, what I'm not going to go through, but they've got that split out. Uh, it's 60% in formula funds and 40% in competitive grants. Uh, and part of what I hope you come away with in terms of what I talked this evening is um, you'll see underneath that competitive grants, they still exactly have not figured out how they want to do this. Uh, one of the reasons that we are talking about this right now is the anticipation that at some point in time, we're gonna get the guidance on how all of this is gonna be structured. At that point, we need to spring into action and make a lot of this happen, but they're still determining uh, final guidance on a lot of the way these bills are gonna be spent. Uh, more information of just how enormous uh, these pieces of legislation are going to be. This is specific for the state of Kansas. So you can see there some of the numbers around infrastructure, public transportation, airports, uh, the total amount that's going to be spent on electric vehicle charging networks across the state, uh, the total amount that's going to be spent across water infrastructure. We had a bill in the Senate Ag Committee this morning dealing with the state's own water plan fund which if it passes would be around $45 million a year for five years, which is a historic investment on the state's part, but you can see it's dwarfed by what the federal government is going to be investing back in, in the state of Kansas even uh, over the next five years. Um, and then the Inflation Reduction Act uh, passed uh, last year, and that also was a historic piece of legislation that had some uh, investments into the IRS and also uh, change uh, tax changes attached to it. Uh, but the biggest part of the IRA for sure was its climate change investments uh, that it was making across the energy economy. Uh, and those as well are, are enormous. And you can see um, the clean energy tax credits, uh, some of what they have set aside for individual clean energy incentives, uh, clean manufacturing tax credits. And I'll go through a bit of those toward the end of this. Uh, but again, just um, we have not seen the the billions of dollars like this um, spent uh, in a long time. That's a really complicated graph and I'm not even gonna try to explain it. Um, uh, but this gets into what the, K the Kansas City Board of Public Utilities even uh, is tracking at all times. And so, again, I'm not going to go through these individually, but you get a sense of 
the broad range of programs that are available uh, that the KCK BPU is even already tracking as they get the, the program structures set up. Uh, we are looking closely at all of these and all of them will have either grants or direct money uh, attached to them. And then I get into the big reason why I'm not gonna go through these slides individually. I mean, look at this. Uh, these are, and if you can drill down to these, many of these have billions of dollars in those programs, billions. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm not gonna go through all of those, but these are all uh, within the Inflation Reduction Act. And so you can get a sense of just how enormous that piece of legislation is uh, and I hate to do this to the board, I'm gonna click past this one, but you can go back and, and look at these because guess what? I felt I feel like I'm selling uh, Ronco uh, appliances on TV, but wait, there's more uh, and, and there's even more. And you can see we compressed these in to even get there. Uh, just the enormity of the monies that are coming down from the federal government uh, but what does this mean for the state of Kansas? Well, first of all, Kansas realized, whoa, we got a lot of money coming in. Uh, so in with between the IIJA and then the BIL, we're going to set up <clears throat> an infrastructure hub uh, so that we can serve as the principal hub of those two bills coming in. And that's why uh, when a lot of people say, well, there's $1.2 trillion in between the IIJA and the BIL. Uh, that may be true, but the bulk of it is going to be funneled through the infrastructure hub and then designated to its various places around the state of Kansas. And so as the federal government ramps up its spending of those dollars, the state is also ramping up its infrastructure hub. Uh, and and managing those dollars coming down. And so those first two bills that I mentioned, that's uh, this is largely the way uh, this is going to be handled. And they are, you know, they have an advisory committee and they are um, putting together these summits and bringing people together to discuss potential ideas uh, with the range of those infrastructure plans that uh, they are federally designated to work on. Um, but already we discovered that there are, you know, there are going to be issues with this. Most of those federal programs with the first two bills required matching funds. And uh, there are some communities, very small communities or disadvantaged communities that simply can't put together the matching funds. And so one of the state legislative priorities this year in Kansas is, do we set aside a pot of money to serve as matching funds for Kansas communities so that they can access these federal programs. And uh, the governor's budget did include $220 million that was earmarked for matching funds so that as these funds become available, uh, we can access those as communities and take advantage of them. Uh, but that budget even has not passed yet, and we won't know if uh, the state of Kansas even has uh, $220 million set aside until probably the very end of the legislative session. Uh, but then on top of that, you know, do you have the uh, internal capacity to apply for these grants? Uh, do you even have a, a SAMS number, which is what is required to, to apply for those grants? Uh, but then as Eve, we've even discussed at, uh, at the Board of Public Utilities, um, let's say there's a program for a large um, uh, safe drinking water act investment uh, for drinking water systems it may require you to know where all of your lead lines are and particularly for the communities in the eastern third of the state of kansas especially uh, uh, wyandotte county and kansas city kansas the older the community, the higher the probability there are going to be pipes where we, we simply do not know where they are. And so uh, that's a hurdle then to be able to go to the federal government and say, hey, we firmly fit in this program, we believe. It would be great for us, uh, but we technically can't apply right now because we don't have 100% of all of our lead limes piped because, or, uh, mapped because we're a 175 year old community and, and it's just a really difficult task. And so the federal government built this structure, uh, they built this in mind, but even as we unroll this, they're realizing, hey, we're gonna maybe have to be creative about some of this because it's, it's difficult. If you can imagine 
Uh, I know it's difficult for Kansas City, Kansas, one of the oldest communities in our state, but all of our communities are infinitely younger than communities on the East Coast, and this bill would apply to them too. So we are not the only ones dealing with uh, these challenges. Um, so, you know, these talk about some of the things that we are working on right now at the state level to probably help with those first two bills. Uh, and then, of course, the organizations that David mentioned early, earlier that are talking to all of their member communities, uh, making sure that everyone knows, you know, this is what's possible, but this is also what uh, is it what's going to take to go out, go out and get those dollars. So uh, continuing to move as fast as I possibly can. Um, uh, these are just encouragements for everybody, including KCKBPU, which has been doing a great job of being proactive figuring out problem areas, figuring out potential hurdles they may have in the future uh, so that when these grants become available, uh, you are ready and able to access them. Uh, but we are, and I say we collectively as a state of Kansas and then everybody across the country, we're not there yet. I mean, we're still putting all of these programs together and you can kind of see the timeline, uh, timeline there and again, uh, you know, if you are listening and you are not a member of the Kansas City, Kansas community, uh, and you are in a community that wants to take advantage of these, I cannot stress to you enough, you can't apply for a federal grant uh, without a SAM, a system of award management number. So if your community does not have one, it needs to start that process right now. Um, now, moving then to uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, these are some of the, the IRS sides of it, uh, but uh, that act, which was specifically focused on climate change and the energy transition associated with climate change, uh, they had their open uh, call for guidance at, that was due at the end of 2022. Uh, they are still assessing all of the comments that came in from around the country, and we still haven't even seen their guidance yet in terms of what the uh, Department of Treasury intends to do as they roll out the IRA, uh, but it also will have a huge impact. Uh, this are, these are some of the players that are involved uh, and acutely involved, and I will mention this. Um, so Janet Yellen is our Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, just this last Sunday, uh, she had to make the drastic action of guaranteeing all of the deposits of SVB, uh, which is Silicon Valley Bank. And the reason I even mention that is because 1,500 of the nation's climate tech startups banked at SVB. And so uh, if you don't think that's going to uh, influence how they think about how they unroll the IRA dollars, it's definitely going to influence that because a key part of the climate change uh, technology stuff is going to be new emerging technologies, most of whom were banking at SVB. And so they secured that, uh, but I think that we'll probably see the influence of that situation uh, play out um, moving forward as she determines the guidelines for the IRA. So these are kind of some of the major winners and losers. Uh, the big winner, uh, the first big winner is hydrogen, massive um, incentive for hydrogen. Uh, and that's nationwide, but they've also structured what they're calling a hydrogen hub competition. They're going to name eight hubs around the country, and each of those hubs will get around a billion dollars. Uh, and those hubs are supposed to have some sort of thematic purpose to them. So each region of the country will have a different themed hydrogen hub. And hydrogen, if, if you are unfamiliar with it, uh, is a flammable gas. It can be used as a fuel. It can be produced through hydrolysis or electrolysis, excuse me. Um, and it is a clean burning fuel. And so the federal government has said, we want to move in the direction of hydrogen. How do we get there? Kansas is in the process of making an application for a hydrogen hub, and that's due on April 7th. And so that's all happening very, very quickly. Uh, and we'll see if we were named as one of the eight hubs, we would definitely see some significant investment for that. Um, next big one. Uh, and this does have implications for the Board of Public Utilities. Tax credits up until this point were pretty hard to access if you were a nonprofit. Uh, so churches and communities themselves, the actual municipality, couldn't really take advantage of tax credits. 
the IRA structured the tax credit benefit in such a way that they were much easier to transfer. So brokers are gonna love the new IRA, of course, uh, but the big winners here are gonna be municipalities because you can take advantage of those tax credits uh, and that's going to help all of the citizens living in a community that particularly if your community is low income and your people living there don't have any um, really opportunity to take advantage of tax credits, the transferability will help the municipal utility. But again, going back to what I said at the kind of very beginning of this, they are still working out exactly what that looks like, uh, both at the federal level and then how it transfers down at the state level. So this is a huge opportunity for us, but we don't know exactly uh, what it will look like. Uh, next big winner, uh, nuclear facilities. They have a huge incentive built into this. Uh, there are no nuclear facilities, to my knowledge, in Wyandotte County. Um, there's really only one in, in the state of Kansas, Wolf Creek. Uh, but it has some major structural incentives built around it. So uh, you'll see benefits around existing nuclear facilities. Uh, of course, the other big winner, um, if these come to fruition, are investments in the IRS, um, which are sort of not attached to the climate side. Uh, and then a uh, big winner is sustainable aviation fuel. If you follow where people are tracking uh, major footprints of, of uh, climate problems, it's on the fuel transportation fuel side, particularly the aviation fuel. And while electric vehicles um, work really well, particularly sort of smaller passenger vehicles, it's really hard to have a battery big enough to put a, an airplane in the air for a long time. So I think you're gonna see sustainable aviation fuel that can either be hydrogen or a blend of different fuel sources to keep airplanes in the air. And again, huge incentive for this, this is, a nascent in, uh, industry. There's really no one on the market right now with uh, a viable, sustainable aviation fuel. So uh, we're going to see huge investment in this over the next few years, and I don't know where it's going to go. Uh, next one, uh, electric vehicle auto dealers. There was that cap for a long time. Uh, and if you had electric vehicles, once you reach that cap, then you no longer were able to sell your vehicles with a benefit. They removed that cap. So there remains a very large financial incentive to purchase electric vehicles. Uh, and I think that's great. And that's also great for any utility, whether it's KCK, BPU, or anyone else. Uh, because one of the difficulties of running a utility is balancing that high load during the day when everybody's got all their lights on and they're running their air conditioning versus the nighttime when people aren't using as much power. Well, the beauty of electric vehicles is that in general, you're probably gonna be cha charging them over the night hours. And so they provide a really nice balance to help balance out that uh, utilities load system, which ultimately makes everything more affordable. Uh, next big winner are industrial manufacturers. There are all sorts of incentives for shifting your manufacturing process to what they're considering decarbonized. Uh, and there's also huge incentives to bring a lot of the uh, industrial processes that are associated with clean energy, whether it's battery production, which we acutely know here in the state of Kansas, Panasonic could not have announced its plant at a better time in history because it has a, an enormous incentive associated with it. Uh, but you're gonna see those. And that's another area where I would expect Kansas City, Kansas will see giant amounts of investment because you do have a lot of heavy manufacturing uh, and uh, there will be all sorts of innovative businesses interacting with your businesses that will want to either decarbonize them or change their processes so that they sort of reduce their thermal heat problems. Most of those require more electricity, which again is good for everybody that's paying rates in the community. Uh, but that's going to take a long time um, to ramp up. Uh, but there's all sorts of new concepts in the Inflation Reduction Act. And if I told you that I know what all of those mean, I don't know what those mean yet uh, because all of this is very new and the Department of Treasury is still outlining kind of what these are. Uh, but there are all sorts of incentives. Some of them are delayed. Some of them will run all the way out until 2032. And it's, it's very abnormal for the federal government to have a 10 year pathway for a program like this, which also makes the uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, really impressive. 
Other cool aspects of the Inflation Reduction Act, there are prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements. Uh, there are efforts um, to make sure that uh, as you are building that workforce uh, and, and building together um, apprenticeships, you're also using as much domestic content as possible. So they very much built in a buy USA element. I'm not gonna go through all of this, but again, all these slides are gonna be available. Uh, there are sweeteners, if you will, to the incentives built into the bill. If you are building in an area that has this historic um, uh, energy production history of other sorts, uh, there are incentives built in. Um, sorry, I, I see if Kimberly has a slide. Uh, I think she'll get to it later. There are incentives built in if you're using certain uh, renewable resources. Uh, or credits. Um, there are investment credits built in. Uh, there are incentives built in if you are uh, investing in disadvantaged communities or uh, tribal, historically tribal lands. Uh, here, okay, here we go. So there are all sorts of incentive sweeteners that are attached to a lot of these programs uh, that are on their way down, but they are not here yet. I, I, this is a dizzying amount of information and uh, I am not gonna go through all of them. Uh, you can see them there, uh, but they just go on and on and on and on and on. Uh, all of these different programs um, uh, that are coming down uh, but again, I stress to you, they're not here yet, uh, and they're going to be incentive-based for larger programmatic issues. There's also a huge amount in the IRA uh, that is for individual homeowners. And I think maybe a lot of times this is an area where people might be confused. Sometimes these have historically come in the form of just sort of block grants. In the IRA, they designed it to incent behavior on the part of consumers. So they want consumers to have more rooftop solar. Uh, so they built a strong credit for consumers to go out and invest in rooftop solar. They're, and consumers still going to have to pay for it up front, uh, but there's a strong incentive attached to it. As we mentioned before, there's a strong incentive to purchase an electric vehicle. The consumer's still gonna have to buy an electric vehicle, but there's a large tax credit associated with it. Uh, you can see all of the elements of that tax credit. There are incentives. Uh, if you buy an electric vehicle, there's an, an incentive to install the in necessary charging infrastructure in your home uh, to help you. And then there are also business incentives for those businesses that want to install electric charging infrastructure. Uh, more about the clean vehicle tax credit. Um, there are tax credits for previously owned clean vehicles. Uh, there are programs for weatherization assistance. And again, back to individuals, there are uh, assistance programs if you want to put in um, uh, if you want to put in insulation in your home, if you want to uh, change out your windows or your doors, uh, all sorts of great rebates associated with those. Uh, but you would have to say, well, I'm going to invest some money in, in, in some insulation. It just makes it cheaper uh, to make it more accessible for individuals. Uh, there are great LIHEAP and LIHEAP programs as well um, that they are determining exactly how they want to structure uh, as they uh, send those programs down and you can see all of this, then uh, there we go, I got to it uh, uh, also. Uh, and then back to like where they are in determining what, um, how to build these programs, they acknowledged as they passed IRA, they, you know, one of the problems with incentive programs for residential units in particular is they work great if you own your home. What happens for, uh, uh, residents of a home that don't own their home, you know, and, and you see that prevalence in lower income communities where they might have a landlord tenant situation. How do you build a, an incentive structure that will incent that landlord to make the necessary investments on that home if the resident is the one paying the utility rates? And I don't, I don't have an answer for you because quite frankly, the federal government did not have a great answer 
uh, on those programs. Uh, but I do know that they are even discussing that as they're working through this guidance because they appreciate it as a problem. Uh, it is, uh, you can build these programs, you can try to design them for low-income individuals. Inevitably, the first people that go out and put on rooftop solar are the wealthiest people in a state because they can afford it. Uh, and they want to drive these programs to lower income communities, but it's difficult. And so they are working on that guidance, but we, we just don't know what that's going to look like yet. That's the end of it. I probably exhausted everyone. I'm sorry. Uh, but the slides are all available. And, uh, and I would say this is an exciting time, uh, but these are going to be much more structured programs coming down. Uh, so there'll be investments in hydrogen, investments in uh, EV charging infrastructure, and, and there will be very strong guidelines on how those dollars are going to be spent. We just don't know where they are yet. Uh, I think there's time for questions, if that's okay. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Not so much a, a question as a comment. Uh, you know, it, it's exciting to see that dollars will possibly trickle down to Wyandotte County, which is something you always wonder where they're going to happen. And and uh, we know that there is a time frame associated with all of them, but it's it's seeing some some light at the end of a tunnel and knowing that it it would be here. So thank you for at least giving us that the glimmer of hope and the vision of the future. What, what's Kansas's chance to be a hydrogen hub, in your opinion? So the question was, what's our Kansas chance of being a hydrogen hub? Uh, so I think we have a strong proposal. Uh, as you can imagine, Texas has two proposals uh, because it's Texas. So there's a state proposal and then Houston has its own proposal. And, and uh, there are a number of different ways to produce hydrogen. They have given them colors. So blue hydrogen is from natural gas uh, that then is turned into hydrogen. Uh, pink hydrogen comes from uh, nuclear energy. Green hydrogen comes from wind and solar. There's hydrogen from coal uh, powered, uh, you know, electric generating units. There's hydrogen from all sorts of different sources. So most of the plans have dedicated, you know, this is where we intend to produce our hydrogen. The Texas, the Oklahoma, those plans are very heavy on natural gas, uh, blue hydrogen. Nebraska's proposal is very heavy on natural gas. Illinois' proposal, which I uh, would assume has a strong chance of being funded, is not so much where they're going to get the hydrogen, but they have an a over-the-road trucking infrastructure model for their hydrogen. That's kind of what they intend to do with it. Uh, there is a Pacific Northwest one that uh, is similar to that. And what makes Kansas's proposal unique is for two reasons. One, uh, of course, we have a lot of green hydrogen. There are other states, or the potential of green hydrogen. There are other states that have that too, but we have a lot of it. Uh, we do have the potential for pink hydrogen uh, coming off of Wolf Creek because uh, Wolf Creek at times uh, it likes to run at 100% all the time. And so in the middle of the night, there's not a lot of need for that 1150 megawatts. This would be a great secondary use for that. So we do have pink hydrogen as an element of ours. Uh, but by far the biggest reason that Kansas's proposal stands out is that uh, we have a storage and midstream component of ours. We have a major pipeline infrastructure in the state of Kansas that is historically natural gas. Uh, but you can put hydrogen in pipelines, and then most importantly, you can store it underground. And outside of the Gulf Coast down by Houston, Kansas has the greatest geology in the nation for storing hydrocarbons underground. And that's largely in uh, the center part of the state, uh, and that's mostly because of salt. Uh, I, you're about to have 30 seconds more about salt geology than you ever wanted, but it's actually really cool. Uh, we have a really thick band of, of bedded salt starting in the center of the state and then sort of sloping downhill underground all the way down into the western part of the state. And salt, to no surprise, if you get it wet and then as it reforms, it is an incredibly 
uh, sealed, impermeable uh, structure. And so they use it right now to store uh, hydrocarbons, mostly crude oil and the natural gas underground, but you can store hydrogen there as well. And so the anticipation would be that there is a giant network of hydrogen storage facilities that start happening in the state of Kansas. Okay. Thank you. There's also the benefit that it's not highly populated under them or above them. Yes, uh, you know, like any element of any utility, there's always the opportunity for accidents. And for those of you familiar with Hutchinson and the Aggie field, which was natural gas, they did have leaking gas. Uh, this was probably around 20 years ago and and natural gas and hydrogen would do the same thing. I mean, if it comes to the surface and catches on fire, it's gonna burn for sure. So Josh, I wanna take you back to stuff you already talked about. Uh... So going through COVID, going through all the federal and state funding uh, uh, that came down through the pandemic and and what people came used to understanding is there was a lot of dollars that went in, provided, provided a wide range of individual assistance on a number of matters, whether it was paying for rent, paying for utilities, you know, other assistance coming down, uh, provide other other coverage these bills again are totally designed for a whole different purpose so if you can kind of walk us through that again because uh, i think that's i don't want to lose sight on that i don't and i want people to fully understand how the government has shifted priorities and you, know, you can just kind of summarize that for sure so again back to the that covid aid uh, it was literally, uh, you know, and it wasn't just utilities focused, uh, you know, no one has to repay their student loans during this time. You know, there are zero evictions during this time, it, it just protecting the general public as everybody figured out what was going on. So those were uh, largely loosely governed blocks of money uh, intended to help. And I think they they did a great job and were really important. These were all specific pieces of federal legislation. And so they had a, a direct intent behind them and they will have the associated rules and regs structured behind them once they're done. And they are going to do very specific things. And <clears throat> that doesn't mean that there's still not gigantic sums of money, uh, but if it's going to be money designated for broadband deployment, it's not likely going to be helping citizens pay for accessing broadway or broadband in their homes it's going to be how do we make sure that we build out the broadband network in underserved communities that currently don't have it so that's that would be like the substantial difference and you see that in particular um you know the other two bills have all sorts of all sorts of infrastructure associated with them the ira is very energy specific uh, but as you saw toward the end of that presentation, they are hyper focused on whatever they wanted to do, you know, incenting a hydrogen hub. Well, spending $1.2 billion incenting a hydrogen hub in, in the state of Kansas is not going to be immediate relief to, to ratepayers anywhere necessarily. Uh, but it is a long term investment that's going to build the structure that will be a new fuel that's accessible to people and hopefully be cheaper and available long-term to everybody. So uh, that's what they were driving at, um, but it's gonna be a much different way of getting there than what was passed during COVID. And a lot of it, again, they still haven't been finally determined by yep. what the federal government or what the state wants to do when it comes to clean energy, other type of investments that the federal government wants to pursue. So we'll continue to monitor and uh, stay close to that. Uh, I guess the my final thing is, I know there, there, there will be opportunity for BPU to seek out some of this funding, uh, but it's, I, don't, I don't see yet where money will be coming directly to the utility that can be transferred directly to the public in terms of offsetting costs or helping them in any with any type of assistance. Yeah, you know, the other example, um, there are wonderful rebates for buying, say, like an induction stove if you have a gas stove, um, but that's not going to be, the BPU wouldn't administer that program. 
the the resident themselves would would have to say, well, I'm you know in the market for a new stove. I have a gas stove, uh, but if I purchase an induction stove or an electric stove, there's a eight hundred dollar rebate attached to it, and so it's a great incentive. Uh, it's going to be most accessible to those individuals that are looking at probably uh, buying a new stove over the next 10 years anyway. The one nice thing, and I, I said that again, you know, this is a 10-year program. So as all of us learn how it operates, uh, we'll be able to access it better. And there's enough time that we don't have, you know, during COVID, there was like, oh my gosh, sign up, we'll take it and we'll figure out how to spend it to benefit everybody as fast as possible. Right. We don't have to do that with this. We have 10 years, uh, so there's no kind of race to just grab the dollars. Uh, it's a 10-year program. We'll have the federal guidance. We'll figure out how it works best, and then we will uh, move forward that way. Right. So I guess my final question and, and comment to the board is, as we look at and work our way through some of this, there will be opportunity for BPU to certainly go out for uh, funds to help us with our infrastructure needs and things like that. Now, all these dollars are out there. If we're tapping into federal and state assistance, that don't necessarily mean that the money is necessarily coming all coming through uh, the rates that we already charge and, and the things that people are currently paying the day. Now, they'll pay it indirectly to, with their federal taxes. I mean, they come back to us that way. But if we lose out on the on those opportunities and don't Go out and seek that those type of uh, those type of funds. That means we are placing the cost of future BPU operations on the backs of our citizens. So we do we do order to ourselves to continue to look for those opportunities and try to uh, seek out funding for those type of investments that we know we're going to have to make. So so Bill, yeah, that's kind of what I got from the presentation. Is is unlike the uh, customer assistance dollars. Uh, that were in, in a lot of the previous programs. This is more of a future cost increase avoidance dollars. Right. So it's putting money into the infrastructures that will either bring down or or maintain the cost of rates for a longer period of time instead of having increases or or shift some of the maintenance costs away from the responsibility of the citizens for a short term right. so that you can rebuild a system without big bond dollars right you know and and basically just get over a hump right. to get your system back into into operation without having to raise rates uh, take take also since we don't know all there is to find out there may be some of this funding may have some type of utility matching piece to go to it so but still if there's a 50 percent matching uh requirement that's still getting half of the project costs funded and we're avoiding the cost of pay all of it ourselves. So. Especially if it's a project that will have to be done eventually anyway. Right. Yeah. Right. Water and infrastructure, water and energy infrastructure projects for sure. Like you have a, a multi-decade plan anyway. And so it fits into that. You could argue that these three bills are going to do more for your average rate payer, you know, in the community over the next 30 years than than the COVID stuff. But yeah, it's it uh it's it's one of those difficult situations where they won't know it because the, the only reason that it's happening, you know, 30 years from now, it'll just be that you were able to keep rates so much lower than they would have been. Um, but that's a, that is a good thing for sure. Yeah. Any other questions from the board? Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, I'll move on into general manager staff reports. Uh, Andrew Ferris. I think you're up next. I did have, I did get a request to have somebody walk through our bill and uh, there's certainly charges on the bill that uh, we're gonna, we're gonna talk to. Andrew's gonna explain why they're on the bill. Uh, why do we collect money? And how does that go back and support our operations?
I'll have to try to find that. Give me a second. Okay. But no, that was a clearly fascinating from, from Josh. Uh, there's, there's a ton of information out there. Even though we don't know so much of the information, there's so much information out there. It's, it's unbelievable how much is out there and, and what we're tracking. And again, we're working with you know, our partners like the KMEAs, KPPs, KMUs of the world, uh, along with the state and so forth. And so uh, we even got a webinar actually later this week uh, actually, I think it's tomorrow, um, to discuss some of these funding opportunities that are coming through the state. Um, not necessarily energy efficiency dollars, but other big internal projects that we'd be working on. So definitely a lot going on. Are you ready for them? Perfect, thank you. Uh, yeah, so today we wanted to walk through a little bit of, of the bill itself um, to discuss kind of the layout, what's included in it, how it works, um, those type of things to make sure that everybody's kind of on the same page about what it is, what it means, and those type of things. So kind of across, one of the things I want to point out before I get started, I guess, is that all of this information is on the website today. So if you go to the residential tab and then go to uh, know my bill or understand my bill, uh, this is already out there today. And so there's a interactive bill out there that you can click on and it flips through the pages. There's also a really great video out there as well that probably explains it much better than I'll do tonight. But both of those are on the website already if anybody wants to see those um, great information. So on the top of the first page, you can see that the information has the account number, customer name, billing date, service location. That is all great information if you need to call into customer service or any of that activity so that they know who you are and, and what your questions are. Um, and then as you move down to the line, there's a summary of the utility bill activity. And so you can kind of see previous month activity, any payments that were made, any late activity there. And then it breaks it down into BPU charges, UG services, and taxes and other fees. And as we slide down just to the right, you can see those charges broken down in a little greater detail. So on that top level, you see charges for BPU services, um, and one of the things I want to point out here is that all the color schemes match throughout the bill. And so it's really easy to, when you see that green or when you see that blue, you know exactly what those are on the other parts of the bill. And so it's really easy, at least for me, to see that color and, and reflect those uh, collectively for either water services or electric services or, or wastewater. Um, and so as we move down, down the right side there, there's charges for the UG services, so wastewater, stormwater, trash, et cetera. And then that, that bottom section there is, is taxes and fees. And as we look to the, to the left, you can see those color schemes again in that pie chart. And so you can kind of see that green color being the water charges, uh, or sorry, the, the electric charges, the blue being the water charges, the gray being wastewater, those type of things. And so you can kind of see what the makeup of this bill looks like for this customer today. As you slide further down on the first page, there's an um, important messages section. That's a great place that we add information that we want to get out to the consumers. Uh, just one more avenue for Dave and customer service to, to release information to the public and hopefully that they have a chance to see. And then there at the bottom of the first page, you can see that, that detachable coupon portion that you may send in with your, your bill payment or those activities that have all your information directly on there. And as we move to the set or the back of the first page, on, on this page, it really is kind of a definitions page and talks more about BPU uh, charges, uh, measurements, those type of activities on, on the back. And, and so if we look at the, the first thing is energy is measured in kilowatt hours or KWH. Um, so one kilowatt hour is equal to 1000 watts of electric energy used for one hour. It's really hard for most of us to understand what that is. I don't see it. I don't smell it. I don't taste it. It's it's something that's happening in the background, but I have no idea what's going on. And so just a little bit about what one kilowatt hour 
is, is if you had a 40 watt incandescent bulb, just like you have in your homes all your life, and this is an incandescent bulb and you put it in a lamp, you would need 25 lamps plugged in for one hour to equal one kilowatt hour. And since we're talking about energy efficiency today, I might as well, what if I replace that with an LED bulb of the same wattage? You would need 200 lamps plugged in for one hour to equal one kilowatt hour. Seems like a lot of lamps plugged in, but that's how energy works and that's how it's measured. We have a lot more difficult time measuring it through our air conditioning and our heating services and those type of activities, but that's how it's measured. Um, water is measured in CCF or 100 cubic feet. That's equal to approximately 748 gallons. So gallons are easier for us to think of and because we can hold that. The 748 gallons is, is hard to picture how much space would that take up in this room or what have you. So as I was thinking through that a little bit, I was, I was thinking, okay, we as people are supposed to drink half a gallon of water per day. I do a terrible job of it, but you're supposed to drink half a gallon of water per day. One person, if they drank the amount of water that they were supposed to drink, it would take them four years to reach one CCF of water. That's a lot of water, at least when you think of consuming it in that manner. So it's just amazing when you, when you think of the concepts of how we measure both water and electric in, in terms of what that means. And then as we move on further down in that general information section, we talk about electric customer charges. These are charges really that provide for the recovery of costs incurred for providing service to the customers. This is not associated with the quantity of power that you consume, but it is there to capture, you know, such things as, you know, customer service, bill pay, um, as well as a portion of the basic plant investments, such as meters, transformers, service lines, those type of activities. On the water side, the water customer charge is also a monthly charge, but it's based on the water meter size. Um, and so for many of us, that's five eighths of an inch coming into your home. And again, that charge is there to cover the cost of providing that service to customers. We also so, talk a little bit. Of, Andrew, hold on, hold on. So, but, if a person consumes zero power, zero water, but they stay connected, then they still have to pay a customer charge because they have access to the system, and all customers are paying for the customer service charge. They're cut, they're paying for all of the infrastructure that's connected to them. That's how we go back and, and pay for all of those services provided to the community. That's right. So the, the bulk of the charges do come through usage charges, although a, a lot of the actual charges are actually built from your transformers to your poles, to your wires, to your meters, up to your home, just so you have the ability to turn that switch if you want to. And so, again, it comes out to be you know less than 75 cents a day to, to have that service for you available to do. And so there is a large portion of the expenses actually fixed that are coming to your home, both on the water side from the piping, as well as the electric side from the wires and poles and everything else. Yeah. So kind of like the access fee. So, so to expand on that a little bit, if, if I'm spending a hundred dollars on electricity and I have two buckets, I have a bucket that's a fixed cost that stays the same and that pays for all the maintenance and upgrades and, and upkeep on a system so that it's available to me. And I have it at $50 and then 50, the other 50 is the rate of electricity. So that's what fluctuate. The base always stays the same. So this other 50 can go up, it can go down. So the bigger the swing in my usage, the more it's gonna, it's gonna impact my bill somewhere from $75 to 125. But if I take that same $100 and I say, you know what, I'm going to make $70 my base, then the only then only 30 is the swing is your is your fluctuation. So so it may not go down as far, but it also won't go up as much. So you're basically you're you're leveling the the waves and fluctuations of bills, which was part of the reason why I, I was one of the ones who really was an advocate for the idea of increasing a base charge because the other thing that we saw is that 
when you have people that are part-time citizens in Wyandotte County, so they use their house for six months, and then they don't use it for six months, if you have a small base fee, then they're not paying very much during those other six months on the maintenance of the system. And that's the biggest cost is the maintenance and upkeep of our system, not the electricity being made. And that's what the customers don't understand. I know. And that's what I'm just, you know, I'm just wanting to make sure that I'm correct in my assumptions with that. You are. And and some of the assumption is that, uh, you know, lower income people use less and, and so forth. And that's that's not always true. We have a very broad demographic of people. You know, large families use more, less efficient homes use more. All of those things are true, and they can be true for all, all groups of people within Wyandotte County. And so there's there's not a perfect method to, to do this, um, but it is we do try to structure that so that you do have some ability to control that, but you also, like you mentioned, is you have some of that less volatility depending on how you set up your, your structure. So um, it is very important the way we, we do that. Um, on the water side, or sorry, getting back on the energy side, on the energy rate component. So the energy rate component is the rider applied to the amount of energy consumed. So that's a variable rider based on the amount of energy you consume. And that is based on the fuel, the fuel and purchase power expenses that we incur during that period. And so that adjusts every quarter based on actual expenses we're seeing both on the fuel side as well as in the market and so forth. And so that adjusts, but again, it's based on the amount of usage that you would incur. So, so can I come on on that one? Yep. So, so that's more like, what's the current price of gas? So, so gasoline in November of last year may have been two dollars fifty cents, and that's what I was used to paying. And the ERC is based on that two dollars fifty cent average. But then a quarter later, three months later, it's it could be averaging two eighty. So we have to adjust for that. But but we're only adjusting that component so it's not impacting that big base number that stays flat it's not we've taken that out of the equation so we're making smaller and smaller fluctuations impacts on the bill for the customer that's correct the, the base number has been set since 2018 and, and hasn't moved since that time keep in mind you can't judge every house the same every house is different that's what you gotta explain to the customer because well my bill was this next door with some mills. Be careful how you explain that. That That is exactly the case. Every, every home is different from an efficiency standpoint, from how we live, whether we we take lots of showers or whether we don't, whether we like it cold or hot or all of those things, number of people, all those things factor into how much energy we do consume. Um, and so then the environmental surcharge, uh, the environmental surcharge is a rider to provide for the annual recovery of the utility's capital investment to projects that are required to meet federal, state, and local environmental regulations. Um, and then as we move further down on that, that back page, our ways to pay the utility bill. And so we, have a, we offer a number of ways, whether it be online, on the phone, through kiosks, at the drop um, Dropbox, all of those ways are ways that our customers can pay uh, their bill. And then farther down on that, on the back side of that coupon, there is it how it has an address change form that customers can use if they if they're moving within Wyandotte County and so forth. As we move on to the second page, it breaks the BPU charges into even more granular fashion. Um, and so on this page at the very top, you can see the BPU customer service hours. Uh, and you can also see all the BPU contact information there at the right. And so those are great ways to reach out if you have questions, concerns, issues, um, and ways to get a hold of get a hold of customer service or the other areas. The area just below that are 13 month graphs for both the electric and water usage. And 13 month graphs are great because they, they show you what you used last year, what you've done over the past year, and how those things have changed from month to month. And one of the things that I would point out here, especially on the electric side, it's very variable, right? Generally when it's hot outside, we consume a lot more power. And for some of us that have electric heat, we consume a lot more power when it's really cold out as well. And so those things vary um, based on that. 
But again, each household is different. We we all live differently. Uh, but that's a really good way to look at your energy. I would encourage everyone that hasn't already to go out on Energy Engage and check that out. It's a great place. You can look at it on an annual basis. You can look at it on a monthly basis. You can look at it on a daily basis. You can look at every 15 minute increment. So if you want to go back and say, whoa, yesterday at 10 p.m., my energy use spiked. What was I doing? Oh, I had the dryer running and I was doing something else, right? Those are the types of things you can see how that how it impacts your bill and, and if that matters in terms of what you're doing. Um, I advocate for that a lot. There's also a ton of videos online for energy efficiency, weatherization, all of those things that, that BPU and, and Dave has pushed out there already. Those are great resources. Um, again, those are the things that move your needle in terms of how much you consume on a on a monthly and annual basis is the weatherization of your home because your heating and cooling of your home account for 40 to 60% of your overall bill. That is what moves the needle. And that's where insulation, weather stripping, all of those things are vital to your home and that envelope that it has. So, so there is- the easiest, easiest way to find out information. What's that? What's the easiest way to find out that information? Straight on our website. If you go straight to our website, whether it's know my understanding my bill, whether it go to my account and you can go to your account and then select energy engage from there. Great ways to look at all that stuff. Great ways to look at all that stuff. And I actively look at it myself for my own selfish purposes. Um, as you move down from there and, and to the right, you can see the actual meter reads. And so for this customer on the electric side, he used 1300 kilowatt hours for the month. And on the water side, he used 24 CCF. And so as we move to the left, those charges are broken down in a more granular fashion even further. And so there's the electric customer charge that we spoke of that does not tie to the actual usage. And then you've got the electric consumption charge, which is in our tariff book. Again, hasn't changed since 2018. The energy rate component is also based on the consumption number. And that varies every quarter based on the actual amount we spend on fuel and purchase power. And then there's the environmental surcharge. And for residential customers, that's based on actual consumption numbers. And so the bottom three are all actual consumption numbers. On the water side, there's a water customer charge. And then there's the water consumption charge. And that water consumption charge is based for this customer on that 24 CCF that we just pointed out a second ago. So that's a variable charge. Just below that, we have taxes and then recent payment activity. And then on the back of the, the second page, these are really the, the unified government charges and services. And so at the very top of that page, you can see the office hours for the unified government, as well as all the contact information there to the right. Those are great ways to reach out to the unified government if you have any questions, issues, concerns. And then down below that on the left, you can see a breakdown of all the charges for all the UG services, whether that be wastewater, stormwater, trash, uh, as well as pilot. And there on the right, there's definitions and descriptions of what those cover, whether that be wastewater, stormwater, et cetera. And the wastewater also has a calculation piece. And so that's how they determine how much they charge residential customers based on their usage during that period of time. And so on that note, I will take any questions you have. I don't have any questions, but Andrew, thank you very much for that. I was, I know I was one of the ones who was kind of pushing for this. And I mean, just making people understand that we're not, we're not trying to hide anything. Well, my comment is please let our customer know, don't compare us with Jackson County, Missouri, Johnson County. We're different all together. They have a different bill for everything. We got one bill, takes care of everything. But we don't explain that enough. Don't compare your bill with your friend in Kansas, Missouri, or your neighbor or your friend that live in Johnson County. Please, folks, realize Kansas City, Kansas is different than both of those entities. We don't get sad enough to get confused when we start comparing one with the other. And that's our point. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew.
as Andrew has already stated, a lot of this information has uh, been on our website for quite some time. And this uh, board meeting video will be be there too for you know future reference if people want to come back and take a look at uh, at Andrew's presentation. If you can't find the other parts, you know, just go to the board meeting minutes and you can you can find it find it here too. Thank you. Thank you. So next, moving on, uh, we're almost almost done. <laughs> moving on, uh, I'll ask uh, Glenn to come up. Said, like said earlier, we've got several presentations. We're going to try to speed our way through this. Okay. Got to I'll be very quick and succinct. Um, so first of all, I didn't hear a safety topic. Quick safety topic. As we change seasons, your tire pressure can change up to two degrees per 10, two PSI per 10 degrees te uh, temperature change. So keep that in mind. Um, I'm not here to ask for money, but I'm here to transfer money. So uh, in our discovery process with CP4, we need to transfer some capital dollars over to an expense account to facilitate uh, this, uh, what I'm going to present to you here in just a few seconds. Um, so I can hit the button, right, Rob? Okay, uh, next, please. So I, I thought I'd explain what our NOx control scheme is. I, I talk about our permit limit, uh, historical view of our performance. And some of these combustion problems we keep having uh, and re-manifesting themselves uh, here, I'll go over that. And some of the options we have to get over that and potential impact to the utility if we don't do anything quickly. So um, next, please. So what the heck is DLN, right? You're running that yourself. Uh, Drylo Knox is our Knox control technology that we use in CT4. And basically, just to be very uh, uh, simple, is down on the bottom right is called pre uh, premix operation. That's where you're changing the temperature of the flame to keep from producing thermal NOx. Thermal NOx is what causes our uh, causes our emissions limits and gets close to our our ban. The problem is, is we don't stay in that premix steady state. We end up jumping to lean lean, which I'll get into later. Next, please. So these are just examples of NOx limits for similar machines. Uh, nine is about where everybody's at. Uh, some of these other units are a little higher. And it really, the emissions limit is not our issue. Our issue is being able to stay in that lean, lean, DLN mode, premix, steady state. Next, please. Uh, there's a lot of challenges with a combustion turbine you guys may or may not be aware of. And as you can clearly see from that graph, uh, that was my best joke. So uh, <laughs> so as temperatures uh, get colder, the air is more dense, harder to compress. It messes with your NOx performance. As temperatures get warmer or there's changes in barometric pressure or humidity, those all affect your NOx performance. Because again, what you're doing is you're taking compressed air, mixing it with your fuel to cool the flame down to lower your NOx. Next, please. Feel important when I can do that. But, um, so you guys have been asked probably in the past uh, for funds, money, capital um, to address these burners. And so what you began to see back in 2017 was our PPM limits were being reached. And when I talk about exhaust thermocouples or OTC spreads across a combustion turbine, you want even heating. If you don't have even heating across the combustion turbine, you can get eccentricity issues, things like that. So it's very important to be very consistent with your temperatures all the way out the machine. So they, we started to notice that, noticing the spreads. They did a nozzle refurbishment, which is what I'm asking to do again. Uh, they did that refurbishment, they reinstalled, and immediately they said, saw the same problems. There was an RCA put out by GE to say, hey, we put those things together wrong. And what it, in simple terms, it was they were compressing the sea seal too much and causing gas leakage out the side, which was creating that flame instability, which is causing the OTC spreads, which causes you to go from premix to lean lean, which causes high NOx. That's the story. So um, we did that fix. 
and the machine has run really pretty decent. Um, but in the summer of 22, this this last summer, we started noticing OTC spreads again. It's like, ah, oh, right. oh, oh shoot. Um, so what we did was uh, get a borescope inspection with GE, and I know those chunks look like they're huge bricks sitting in there, but they're really flecks of rust. So what we've noticed is from our compressor section through our purge valves that purge the gas out when we trip, we're blowing that material in. And when it blows into those very fine chamfered and sized orifices, you're blocking the flow. You block the flow, you get flame instability, and then, then you get the domino effect, correct? So that's what we found. So what we did is attempted an on-site cleaning. We went and vacuumed as much material out of there as we could. We want to come back with the unit and test it. And like I said earlier, as it gets colder, we know our NOx is going to underperform. So we were waiting for a warm day and finally got that. And then our servo valves, which are a different story, but we just recently got the ability to run this machine. And we are still in a, a state where we don't feel like we can run it comfortably through the summer and stay within our emissions limits uh, just because of we keep rejecting back to this lean lean mode and like the difference between DLN mode or premix steady state and lean lean is about I don't know 50 60 ppm in ox clearly violating next please before you sorry before you jump too far so is the rust coming from like condon <clears throat> excuse me condensation from the fuel coming in at a cooler temperature than the heated? So it's compressed air, that's the purge media. So compressed from the compressor section of the CT, it goes in the combustion cans and it mixes with the fuel. This is coming from the air side, so to speak. Okay. So this debris, uh, uh, our engineering guys and maintenance folks got together, <laughs> they found where all this debris was. Uh, we cleaned as much as we could, but it's still not right. And we need to replace those. We need to refurbish those nozzles uh, and able to take advantage of some of these lower gas prices and the peak season we know we're going to face during the summer. So I'd rather kick back some of these other projects, move them out a year. None of those are a risk to safety or generation, uh, but there are just timing issues that we can afford to push them out to other years, 24, 25. Do we feel like the lifespan that we got off of this last refurbishment is a reality going forward each year, each time, four years or so? Each time it's been a different issue. Okay. Um, so this is another unique machine because it is a dual fuel. So uh, when you burn fuel oil in one of these machines, you get what's called coking. And coking is that material that you can looks a lot like that rust that can plug your nozzles as well. So this is a unique machine just because it is dual fuel. And I don't know if I'm answering your question, Jeff. I can kind of forget what it well, was. Well, I, I kind of think you are. I mean, my question is, is, you know, we we did this the first time it sounds like it was more, it was an anomaly, I'll take it, because they, they were done wrong. So that's not anything that would have been controllable or even a result of usage. It was just improper. Right. Uh, construction. So this so, though, this period, this time period that where they were fixed and we put them in and now it's ran up until this point that we're talking about, is that in any way we think that it'll be the the frequency of this kind of maintenance for this? No, I, I, there are two different situations. This debris is becoming from rust or a deflocculation or a flocculation of rust particles in the purge valves. I love that word too. That's yeah, I, man, I looked it up before I yeah. came in today. I remember from water. But we bore scoped everything we could bore scope and we went back and we believe we found that source being <laughs> these cast iron valves that control the purge uh, air. I know I'm speaking in terms. No, of I, I get what you're saying. But we found that those valves were rusty. So we're replacing those valves. Okay. Yes, All right. That's, that's what I, was, I just didn't want to see or wanted to understand, is this just going to be an ongoing every three, five years? It's going to be just a cycle because it happens at times. That's, what, that's why Bill has me presenting. <laughs> well, and that's why I asked you the other day, too, a similar question. Yeah. You know, so when you when we're looking at what life is left in, in CT4, mm -hmm. uh, what do we now need to consider based on our recent history on 
what does the annual maintenance of this unit look like? You know, are we doing this every two years, every three years? There may be different causes, but are we having to come back and address, you know, different things on what type of rotation? To be honest, this stopgap, I believe, okay. uh, to get through this summer season in 2024, I believe this fix will get us to a point where we believe we need to order a spare set. You talk to GE, uh, the dual fuel DLN ones are just finicky machines. So they require a lot of care and attention. And the, the dry low uh, DLN technology is just like they're right there at the bitter edge of compliance in, in, in some temperature ranges. And in that period of time, we'll get the return on our investment on the I, I believe so. I got a text from my boss that, well, the potential for revenue would well, I, I know it's an ungiven because, but but the expectation based on what we've seen in the past couple of years, you know, the 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 well, past couple of years kind of weird, uh, but past usage of C four, you know. Yeah, it runs it runs more in the summer, more of a peaker uh, as all those air conditioners kick on, all that inductive load goes, uh, your your voltage sags, so it's there for voltage support and it's also there for load support. So it serves two, two functions. So we do have a longer term study with GE uh, to understand what we can we do go, be doing going forward to make these operate longer in the season. Uh, within compliance, because we just haven't been very successful in the past. Do you know what the, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm picking this part. Do you know what the expected life expectancy, the, the balance of life expectancy on CT4 uh, estimated? It's a fairly young, it's an old machine with very little operating hours. I say that you've gone. Parts available, you know, has it become obsolete, you know? No, there's a lot of 70 A's out there. There's not a lot of 70 A dual fuel because it complicates <clears throat> issues, but there are a lot of, there's a lot of life left in that machine. Okay. All right. So Jeff, one thing I've talked about is um, getting this group together to go back and look at our old Black and Beach future generation plan. And we haven't looked at that in a while, but we do need to look at updating that on all the units, in, including Nearman, Nearman One. So what is the, what's the life expectancy on everything that we operate? And, you know, because I think I've heard different things on CT2, CT3. So I want to, you know, kind of nail that down as much as possible. And then the other part is when we do get close to the end of life, then what's the replacement plan? So we, need to, we need to have some solid plans around that. And, you know, I think that, I think that especially if you dovetailing off the previous presentation by Mr. Zavadi, that if there's going to be potential dollars out there for us to offset some of our regular maintenance costs on our system that that then we you know having already an idea of what our life expectancy and and what our replacement needs would be to keep our you know to keep our availability correct for the SPP you know now would be a good time to at least understand what the plan needs to look like so that when those dollars do come free Maybe it can be an offset, you know, to bond dollars. I mean, you know, I'm just looking at maybe we could spend cash for some of these, you know, probably not a new unit, but uh, uh, I'm just I'm just trying to make sure that we're, you know, as we're getting into a very volatile situation, and a lot of these are coming toward end of life on these machines on our on our manufacturing uh, equipment that we're making sure the money that we're putting back into it we'll have time to recoup our investment before it becomes. I agree. That's why we need to yeah. go back and revisit our plan. Yeah. That's why I owe you a capital budget mm -hmm. and to answer the why. And to, at the end of the year, I'd like to tell you why or how your money was spent and what we, what we gained. But I'm sorry. And I love hearing that. <laughs> so this is like the both. Black Start unit. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. it is. And that's, that's why it's okay. dual fuel. Okay. There, there's a Black Start diesel. And then there's the CT4, which is supposed to start Nearman 1, which is supposed to bring the world back to life, okay. I think. 
Well, you asked for some money transfer. Let's get down to the nitty gritty here. <laughs> yeah, I'm Nita. sorry, I had a question. Can I ask a question, Glenn? Sure. So the 11 week outage, is that right? Can you give a beginning date and end date for that? So uh, we, RFPs were received this morning, actually, talking with Steve Ritter and Chad Newbell and uh, Doug Bowen. Uh, there's three different bids. One can start Monday, um, and the time frame's a little shorter than 11 weeks. We just threw 11 weeks out there as a swag, and actually the 500000 is kind of a swag. Uh, we needed to get commitments in, in actual dollars. So Solzer, GE, and APG were three bidders, and we're going to try to find the best, best one. I'd love to get it done before the end of our uh, spring outage on Nearman 1. Really right. what my goal is. Thank you. All right, you want to? I open that is yes um, yeah so uh dang now i can't read it uh so we're transferring an aeration air blower these were uh blowers that uh just chronically fail but we've got a good pm program on those um super heat spray valve all that oh there you go uh, that's why you get paid all that mm -hmm. uh automation super heat spray valves and crusher dryer replacement We'll run into that account down there on number one as an expense account to fund that activity. And I need the board's approval for that. Okay. I move to approve the budget transfer. I think that all roll call, please. Roll call. Runneman? Aye. Haley? Aye. Mylan? Aye. Mulvaney Henry? Aye. Bryant? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. That motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very important Thank you. unit for us. That's why I'm yeah. always concerned about its longevity. I yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So there's another very important topic that we want to get to today. We've been uh, looking at the water slide, and we certainly talk about reliability quite a bit on the electric slide, and, and uh, DJ is going to talk about the uh, reli reliability project we just completed on the water slide. I'll just I want to steal your thunder. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Bill. So my name is Derward Johnson. I go by DJ. I work in the water engineering department. Um, today I'm going to talk about the emergency interconnect we have with Water One. It's located 117th in parallel. Uh, we have three different um, interconnects with Water One, but uh, this one today we're focusing on is 117th in parallel. Uh, so first, you know, what what is uh, when, when was it installed? Why was it installed? What does it do and how do we use it today? Uh, that's the first objective. And then uh, we'll go through some of the construction work that was done. Uh, we'll discuss the exercise that we completed here in January, the exercise that interconnect, and then I'll give a brief summary. But my hope is that at the end of this presentation, you'll be able to better understand this redundancy feature that BPU has uh, and have confidence in our preparedness to use it in the case of an emergency. Next slide. So when was it built? In 2010, uh, Water One completed its Walcott water treatment plant and a 60 inch transmission main that went across the Western part of Wyandotte County. At that time, it was decided that we needed an interconnect with Water One for emergency purposes. Um, engineers at that time uh, were hired to look at where's the best place to put it to get the maximum um, production or ma maximum amount of water from that interconnect. So at this uh, 117th and parallel location, uh, we can receive about 20 million gallons a day through this interconnect. So um, they have they operate about 100 psi at that location, and uh, our operating pressure at that location is about 80 psi. Next slide, please. So this um, graphic is pretty familiar. I think it's a map of our water distribution system. So the brownish colored area is our parallel uh, service area. Uh, it's the it's supplied by the Milan and parallel pump stations. Uh, it supplies water to the I-435, the 2 million gallon elevated storage tank there. Um, the light blue area is the central service area. It's um, about 20 PSI differential between the parallel system at a lower pressure than, than parallel system. But all the water into central is supplied through parallel. And then the green area at the top is a Walcott service area. So the Walcott service area and the central area are um, operated through pressure reducing valves. 
uh, that that regulate the pressure down for those those systems. So the primary purpose of this uh, interconnect is that if something were to happen to both Argentine, I'm sorry, to both parallel and Milan pump stations, we wouldn't have enough water to supply that um, area of our community. Um, so if something happened to the water treatment plant and it couldn't get water to the reservoirs that are located at those pump stations, that would be a problem. Uh, and then the the pump stations themselves, if they were to both go down or that transmission main, um, that service territory is about uh, 34,000 service connections, 85,000 customers, which is between 40 and 50% of our demand. So it's a pretty significant area and we wouldn't want it to, to be out of service for very long. So with the average day demand, um, we could, we really have about 24 hours uh, time to decide, are we gonna be able to get the equipment, the um, pump stations or the reservoir um, operational again, or are we gonna have to operate that inner tie? And so we have to you know, make decisions pretty quickly uh, whether to use that uh, inner tie um, or not. So next slide, please. So this is a schematic of that interconnect, a little more detail. So across the bottom is the 60 inch transmission main from Water One. Um, parallel Parkway obviously is on the right hand side. So um, within that fenced in area uh, is, is all the below ground piping. So there's no above ground structure here. Everything's below ground. The reddish line in that graphic is the below ground vault structure that is where all of the control of this uh, happens. So this graphic, even though it's pretty busy, it's in our emergency operations plan. The valves that are identified there are identified in written, uh, written procedures on what valve opens first, second, third, et cetera. The same graphic or similar graphic is in our operator's control room at the Nearman Water Treatment Plant so they can uh, better understand how this, this thing functions as well. Um, so within that vault structure, there are two butterfly valves that were originally installed. Uh, both of those uh, regulate flow, but given the um, pressure differential that we have between our systems, those do not regulate the, the flow very well. Also, those valves were um, controlled are controlled by Water One. So we don't really want Water One controlling water into our system. Um, it's okay for them to control it into theirs, but we didn't really have um, much involvement with, with um, being able to control that. So uh, we decided we need to put in a 24 inch ball valve that will help us to regulate and it will still provide water both directions. So we can receive water from water one and water one can receive water from BPU. Uh, there are two fire hydrants on that site to allow uh, water one to flush their service line before we use it. Same BPU can flush their service line before we supply water to, to water one. Um, next slide, please. Before you move on, DJ. So, yes. So you were saying that it can, water can go either way, but as, as in, water one has a higher pressure Correct. than ours, but we can, they can work it where it can still back into Correct. their so higher pressure their, system. Um, their plant operates at a higher pressure gradient than our system. Um, so it makes it a lot easier for us to receive water from them. But in an emergency, their plant may be down. So their pressure gradient is going to be lower. And so we would be able to provide water to them. Um, and, you know, we, they would be at a, obviously at a lower pressure than our makes sense. 80 PSI. Okay. I yeah. didn't think about that. Yep. Yep. So, um, but it does make it easier to test. So um, now I'm just going to go through a few slides of the construction work that was done. So first, um, we, we bid out. Uh, work to install this butterfly or this ball valve that we had and Crossland Construction was the, the winner of that bid process. We've used Crossland before and we really like uh, the work that they've done and they've uh, again done work for us before and we really appreciate their their work with us, with us in that. So the first step was to remove the uh, lid on top of the um, vault. A uh, portion of that vault has a removable lid, which allows us to get the ball valve in and out or work on the piping in, in, with inside. Next slide, please. Um, again, just construction pictures of it being removed. Next slide. So this is the existing piping that was in the vault prior to the installation of the ball valve. So on the left-hand side, that straight run of pipe, that's where the new ball valve gets to be installed. And then uh, the far right-hand side slide, those are the two butterfly valves on the opposite end in that vault. So this vault structure is about 20 feet wide and 30 feet deep. Uh, again, everything's below grade, but um, it's definitely serviceable. And um, there's a, a SCADA system that allows us to control the valves in there and water one as well. Next slide, please. 
So again, next step in the construction is to cut the pipe, weld on the flanges, um, have to have a certified welder, has to be you know, welded outside, inside, et cetera. Uh, next slide. Uh, next step is to repair the mortar lining inside the pipe, add, add on the reducers from 30 inch down to 24 inch, and then install the ball valve. That ball valve weighs about 6,500 pounds. So it's not easy to maneuver once in there. They had to set up a, a bridge crane and, and move it around uh, once it was installed, to, just to get it installed. Next slide. So uh, on the right, on the left-hand side, that's a 24 inch, or I'm sorry, a 30 inch mag meter. So it measures flow in both directions. It's a positive flow when we send water to water one and it's negative flow when it um, is water back to us. So that's uh, on the right-hand side, that's the completed construction and the guy's painting the pipe back to the way it was before. So this is the slide, this is the site uh, after all the construction has been done. So you can see there's really nothing to see inside that fenced area. We set up a temporary uh, camera uh, on a, through Jeff Rye, he um, set that up for us to be able to monitor the site while the vault was open. Next slide. So now that that construction work is done, we had to go to, uh, the next step is to in, involve our testing. And so there was a lot of work um, trying to determine when's the best time of year to do this test. What are all the um, different considerations we need to take into account? Uh, the demand of Water One, the demand for BPU, what other projects do we have going on, have adequate staffing. Uh, and so clearly um, the cold weather months uh, are the best time to, to, to exercise it because it's low demand period for both them and us and low construction period. The only thing we had to worry about in staffing is being able to do day-to-day -day operations and um, you know have people not on vacation through the holidays um, to, to staff this, this event and, and, and to take samples too. So uh, next we had to communicate with our regulatory authorities. So KDHE was contacted to let them know that we were gonna be exercising this interconnect. They were happy to hear that we have the interconnect and that we're testing it, but they were also concerned about water quality um, differences between us and water one. They soften, we don't, their pH is much higher than ours. So. Um, they wanted to make sure that we were going to be doing adequate sampling and we took precautions to try to make sure that uh, there weren't going to be any issues uh, when, when we put Water One's water into our system. We also took into consideration customers. So we're right there by the Legends. Uh, and so Legends customers would, would see that first. You know, what if we start getting calls or complaints from them, taste and odor issues, turbidity issues. Um, we have wholesale customers out in that area too. So a lot of demands going out that way. So just a lot of concerns with that. Uh, with Water One, they wanted to know, you know, what was our flow rate? How long were we gonna operate it? How much total water were we gonna receive? Um, how were we gonna control it? Uh, and, and two, how is the communication gonna flow between us and them just to make sure that everything flowed smoothly? Um, next slide, please. So this is a selected area of our distribution system. Um, the blue lines are clearly our transmission and distribution mains. Uh, right in the center uh, of, the, of the map is the interconnect location. Uh, the pink line is the 30 inch transmission main of our system. So just downstream or uh, toward the, to the left uh, is the, um, a sample location that we picked about a mile away uh, downstream from where we would receive water. Uh, just north of that, about 115th and, and Leavenworth Road uh, is another sample point about a mile, mile and a half away that we sent, collected samples during this event. And then we also collected them at the um, I-435 water tower. So we had people strategically placed at those locations, roughly mile, mile and a half away and at the site, collecting samples, doing analysis at the site and sending samples back to the <laughs> water treatment plant for um, you know, looking at corrosion long term. So even though this was a short term test, we wanted to evaluate those water quality parameters and what was the implication uh, long term. So surmise it to say that even though their water is a much higher pH than ours, uh, we saw very little pH difference during this test. This test only lasted about four hours. So we started about nine o'clock in the morning. We ran to about 1230. Um, we slowly ramped up the flow. Uh, to about five, five and a half million gallons a day, and then tapered it back down. So from uh, the operators would operate the, the um, 
operate the valve every 20 minutes, uh, open it up a little bit until we got to the, the, the flow rate we were achieve, or hoping to achieve, and then we stepped it back closed. So what you'll see in this graph is pretty busy. The top line is the water pressure at, at water one uh, at this uh, interconnect location. So it's about 100 PSI. The red line is our pressure at that site. It's about 80 PSI. The squiggly blue line just under that is the flow rate. Um, and again, it's in the negative because it's we're receiving water from them. Um, and then the stair step um, graph, the blue line on the bottom, those, those are the incremental uh, changes in the valve position over time. So uh, again, that window of time is only about four hours, 9 a.m. to about 1230 when we stopped. We collected out uh, samples, water samples every hour. Um, you know, beginning at, the, at the very, from the very beginning to just just past when we uh, shut the shut the main down. Next slide, please. So again, uh, we have this one water or we with this one interconnect at 117th and parallel. We have two other interconnects with Water One. Uh, there's an eight-inch connection at 51st and Quivera um, that is on a pressure-reducing valve, so that if um, the pressure in that area of town drops, it will automatically open up to supply pressure to that area. That was installed just a few years ago um, when we were starting to see some subsidence due, due to ground movement, due to the caves in that area. So we were having main breaks in that area frequently. And so this was a, a interconnect to put in to help um, those customers that were affected by that um, to, to minimize those implications. Um, the other one is a 24 inch interconnect about, about Knoll and County Line Road. That serves the Argent, both of those serve the Argentine area, which is the gray area in the lower portion of that, um, of that service territory of, of our county. Uh, next slide. So just to summarize quickly, uh, the interconnect was successful. We did not have any water quality issues. We did not have any pressure issues. Uh, there was a lot of anxiety over are we going to see these um, customer complaints and how are we going to recover if we see customer complaints? How well are we going to be able to regulate the flow with those low, low flows? Are we going to see pressure surges? Are they going to have main breaks as a result of it? So there's a lot of anxiety associated with it, but this was a, a great test. And I want to thank Bill for you know, really pushing for that because it's important to be prepared when we have an emergency. If we've not used it before, it's one thing to have it, but now we've been able to test it. We can um, say that we've tested it. Uh, we didn't test it to 20 million gallons a day. We don't want to turn our water over. Um, KDHE did say that if we needed to uh, use it for a longer period of time, they'd want us to do a study and look at the long-term implications of the water um, blending because of corrosion and concerns over lead and copper and, and all that stuff. So we didn't want to get into that. This was a great uh, opportunity. Gave the operators experience, great, gave all of our staff experience, and uh, helped us to communicate with our um, neighboring utility and within BPU between the distribution and, and production area. With that, I can open up to any questions. I don't have a question. I have a comment that let's hope that neither of us ever need to use this, but it is nice to know that we have that backup in, kind, in case of a catastrophic emergency. Absolutely. Yeah. My comments, if I recall, we have 107 employees in the water department. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. You haven't had a great increase in 10 years. Is that correct? And you got to do all these things here in our current budget. Is that correct? Bottom line is you need more money. Is that yes. correct? Yes, sir. Just want the board to know. <laughs> yes, sir. Absolutely. The condition of the water department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, DJ. Thank so, you. I mean, DJ. to me, it's important for us to continue to focus on both sides of the utility yeah. and uh, address concerns, whether it be on the water side or on the, on the electric side. There are issues with that come up on both sides, and uh, we're just trying to work hard to make sure that our public is being served to the best abilities we can do that. So, last uh, thing, I'll be quick. Miscellaneous comments. Uh, next week on the 23rd, we'll be meeting with our utility assistance partners. Uh, Fast United Way to come in. It's going to be continuing conversations with them on on what are they facing with the public? How are how are what questions do they have? 
what do we need to do to answer those questions and, and assist them as they work hard to assist us and the people that are seeking out utility assistance from BPU. So we'll, I'll have all every one of those agencies come in for a meeting in this room and I'll have some staff there and we'll be uh, just information gathering and then uh, information sharing with uh, with each one of those groups. So it's just, again, continuing conversation with the public, try to see how we can continue to address the concerns there. So that's all I have for tonight. Sorry for all the presentations, long board meeting, but uh, just try to get some of this stuff uh, out in front of you and uh, so we can move on to other conversations. Thanks, Bill. Uh, we'll move to board comments. Mr. Groneman. Uh, I'd just like to thank everybody that presented uh, tonight at the uh, work session and at uh, the general session. It's very informative, even though it was lengthy, but uh, it was worth it. And uh, I want to thank them for the uh, effort that they put in. And also want to remind everybody that uh, uh, March 31st and April 1st is the APPA uh, Lineman Rodeo, which uh, is being hosted uh, by the uh, KCKBPU and be held out at the um, Ag Hall of Fame grounds. So if you have an opportunity to get out there, be sure and, and take it because it's uh, very interesting. That's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Haley, you have comments this uh, evening? Yeah. yeah, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I too would like to thank everyone for the presentation and uh, also extend to our GM, don't apologize for the uh, what would be considered information overload. I found it to be, as I'm sure many of us did, to be most informative. And I thank uh, the review that has been had. Also, um, Josh Foddy in lieu of Kim Kimberly not being there as well, covering some of the opportunities that we have to recover some of the funding before it gets away from us that we can, especially for our low income um, rate payers or, or service payers. Thank the public too for their input as always. Um, I just appreciate the staff update on the areas that they have. I've learned quite a bit. I'm glad to know that we have that rebate, rebate available certainly for energy efficiency or through some of the renewable energy um, that that is out there. And so um, just appreciate the, again, the presentations that we had and we'll give a fuller update on the Economic Development and Finance uh, Committee meeting that uh, was held about a week ago, Monday, at our next meeting, if I might, Madam Chair and members. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haley. Mr. Milan. Thank you. I have uh, several comments. I hope my comments can last more than five minutes. I got to go back in history a little bit. If I recall some time ago, uh, Mr. Tyne Gorman submitted a list of persons that he contacted about BP stem form of fashion. That consists of about 10 pages. I got the page of the page. Some of these people here are friends of mine and relatives. And I asked the question, do they have some kind of contract or what is the should come from? Well, I got it from different places. I let, let you know where it came from. I said, be fine. So he accommodated me with that. And then last week, he brought in a list of persons that signed up for Swan with BP to a certain extent. It's just one statement here. I think the board has copied this. Say the thing they suggested or what he suggested. And he said, well, these comments came from a lot of people. Well, I got 25 pages. Page one, page two. All these pages came from what he brought back and gave to Mr. Johnson, my request. So this leads me to a comment today about the meet we had today about this new committee, what we call a committee. Community engagement. Committee engagement. So for the conversation, I heard from the committee that the select person that should be part of that bucket. Well, I've got 25 pages here. So maybe you might want to use these pages to start what you want to do. Now, with that comes a couple other things. If I recall here, 
at the time that I became a member of this board here, I took a oath of office right over there. I said, I will do this, I will do that. And from that situation, uh, I took an oath of office that I would support BPU, et cetera. And then I signed a pledge. I think all board members somewhere had signed this pledge. Am I right, Mr. HR? You should have one of these in your file that says, I will agree, I will abide by the position of the facility for water and power. But heavens can't say can't. That's fine. But I'm still concerned because I have a term X policy here. If 19 pages, board members, if you don't have one, you need to read it. Because what I'm hearing now is different things that's coming from this side of, of Kansas to the west side of Kansas. It's called, uh, uh, what you call it? Senate Bill 154, Senate Bill something else, and so forth. So we, real, I'm in a two different situations here. I'm going to get representation from here. I'm going to get representation from Topeka. Now, you can't serve two masks. That's in the Bible. You can't be the plant and the at the same time. You can't go yes in one location and no other location. So I've got a problem, folks. I'm just saying we need to take a look at it. What's our responsibility? We took over to the office, sign a place. We have an ethics policy here. Folks, we need to do what we're supposed to do in the right vein. We cannot be controlled by two entities. The picture saying one thing, and this board saying another thing. Something's wrong someplace. That's my comment for now. I'll deal with that a different time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marlin. Uh, my comments this evening, I'd like to thank all the presenters uh, from the work session here in the regular session this evening. Um, I really wish that we would have had Josh's um, presentation before we had it. 68 pages is a lot to go through. Um, and I would have loved to have been able to review it beforehand so we could have actually had time for questions. So I will renew my request. I know we got some of the presentations before the meeting tonight, some of them yet today, um, but I would renew my request. And I know that that was an outside presentation, but um, I, I would still renew that request. Um, and I do think that it, it is obviously going to be important to keep tabs on, on that information of the federal funds that are flowing to the states that potentially could be utilized by the unified government and BPU um, to benefit this community long term. So I'm glad that Josh was able to come in tonight and, and present that, but um, it's something we've got to continue to monitor, and I know we will. Uh, I oh, I also want to thank the members of the public who joined us this evening, both here in the room and, and on Zoom. Uh, again, we appreciate the continued engagement, and that's all I have. So, Mr. Bryant, we'll go to you. Thank you. Um, so once again, I will leave a meeting with a lot to reflect upon. Uh, as always, well-planned presentations, well-delivered, and very educational. All of you, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to talk about Andrew's presentation of the bill, since I did push for that a lot. You know, I, I my day job, I spend my days predicting costs and analyzing the actual results. Uh, over 12 years on this board, I've poured over the utilities financials and I feel confident the BPU offers competitive rates without any markup to repay investors. The biggest difficulty in proving this to others is the addition of the UG bill fees on the utility bill. I'm hoping some people watch this presentation to see that we have no concerns with transparency. Our issue is with finding the best ways to get this information to our customers. I'll continue to lobby for these types of presentations as, as one more avenue of communication between ourselves and our residents. So thank you all again for the presentations tonight. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. Mrs. Gonzalez? Well, um, when I was leaving my neighborhood to come to my meeting today, um, there's a BPU crew that was um, electrifying the new townhomes that are being built um, right on my block. So 
my favorite part about seeing the BPU trucks in the out in the out in the community is I always pull over and try to have a conversation. So I had a long conversation with uh, four of our workers that were working there. Um, so that's one one thing um, that I always reflect on uh, um, about holding this post. I'd like to thank Jeff and Rose for volunteering to serve with me to um, try to get the community involvement group off the ground and um, for all the other ideas we got from other board members and from Bill today and um, for the help that we're gonna get from Patrice and for your presentation, Patrice, and for all the presentations during this meeting. Um, sometimes I leave with just information overload. So um, I just, I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. This is Jeff, so moved. Uh, not in second. It's been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Roll call, Grenneman. Aye. Haley. Aye. Mylan. Aye. Mulvaney Henry. Aye. Bryant. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. That motion carries. This meeting is adjourned.